Hi, everybody. Uh, hello, and welcome to St. Martin's Press virtual event. I'm Martin Quinn, marketer with St. Martin's Press, and I'm here with my friends and authors, Alan Paul and Andy Allador, authors of the New York Times bestselling book, Texas Flood, the inside story of Stevie Ray Vaughan. It's out in paperback this month. Uh, the 30th anniversary of Stevie's death just passed, and we thought it was a good time to celebrate his work, talk to his fans about his music and the book. And I'm going to take a minute to introduce the book and our authors. Uh, Texas Flood is a culmination of three decades of work, hundreds of interviews with the folks who knew Stevie best, and Alan and Andy poured a lot of love and insight to it. Uh, in addition to speaking with Stevie himself, both of them have, his brother Jimmy and Double Trouble bandmates, the book draws from conversations with Buddy Guy, Greg Allman, Warren Haynes, Eric Clapton, B.B. King, many, many more musicians and peers. Um, about each of our authors, in addition to Texas Flood, Alan is the author of another best-selling book, One Way Out, the Inside History of the Allman Brothers Band. Uh, Alan is also the leader of two bands, Big in China and Friends of the Brothers. The latter uh, is a premier tribute to the Allman Brothers Band featuring members of Les Brers, uh, Greg Allman, Dickie Betts, and Jimbo. Um, this band also features our co-author Andy Alador, uh, recognized as an, an essential contributor to the international music scene for his work as a journalist, instructor, and performer for the last 35 years. Over that span of time, he conducted hundreds of interviews and lessons with the world's greatest guitarists. He's toured and recorded with original Jimi Hendrix bandmates Mitch Mitchell and Buddy Miles, uh, with Stevie Ray Vaughan's band Double Trouble. Uh, and with Dickie Betts of the Alvin Brothers Band. Alan and Andy, good to see you. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to start with- Hey, Martin. Them. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. Uh, good to see you. I'm going to start with a few questions uh, that came from your Texas Flood Facebook page, and then we'll start taking questions in the chat from people attending today, and we invite everybody to ask uh, whatever they want. So- Okay. Um, you knew Stevie and his music really well before you started this book. You put a lot of effort and time into it. What new did you learn as you were writing the book? How did your view of him change? And we can start with Alan on this one. You know what? Just because this is something we've been asked before, and Andy and I have a similar different answers, and it makes more sense on this one for Andy to go, to go first. Okay. <laughs> it builds, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just because it's, it's, uh, it makes sense. Temporarily, you'll that's true. We don't we don't put the cart. We would be literally putting the cart before the horse. Otherwise, that's right. Um, uh, and Alan is correct. You know, uh, we did a tremendous amount of research. You know, just as a, a you know to lay the groundwork for a second. Um, I met Stevie in 1986, and I saw him play in 1984 at a little club, and. Um, uh, started interviewing Stevie in 86 and getting to know him. And then I met Jimmy Vaughn in uh, 89 and, um, Alan, I believe, uh, got to know Jimmy Vaughn in 93 or four around that time. And so for the two of us, it's a long time in the making, um, and our own personal experiences with Stevie and with Chris Layton and Tommy Shannon and Reese Winans, Stevie's bandmates in Double Trouble. And so, you know, in the 30 years, um, we had definitely, each of us learned quite a bit about Steve Ray Vaughan. But when we really got to the writing of the book, uh, there were some things that were revelations to us. And so this is sort of how the two answers, and for each of us, um, are uh, the way it affected us dovetail together. You know, uh, we knew that Stevie was had serious problems with substances um, and that his uh, drug and alcohol intake almost killed him. You know, we knew that as a fact. Stevie told me that himself. In fact, when I met him for the first time, he, you know, it was only uh, 51 days that he'd been sober because he decided to share that with me. He wanted to talk a lot. Uh, almost too candidly about what he had been through. Um, in the writing of the book and talking to family members, bandmates, friends, Jimmy Vaughn, 
uh, Stevie's brother, those closer to him. What was surprising to me was the depth of Stevie's substance abuse, the, that it was almost beyond belief. And the correlation I draw is to Charlie Parker, who, by the way, we're celebrating the 100th anniversary of his birth. Charlie would have been 100 years old. Um, but Charlie Parker was a genius jazz bebop saxophone player who, when he was on stage, his life was perfect. He was regarded as the greatest sax player alive at the time. The second he stepped off the stage, his life was complete shambles. He didn't know where he lived. He slept in his clothes, uh, in drugs, uh, completely ruled his life. And Stevie was very much the same for a long period of time. Um, his own bandmates were shocked uh, how, uh, what rough shape Stevie would be in but if they could get him to the gig and get him propped up on stage with his guitar, he, invariably he would play and sing great. And it would be a phenomenal show. Um, so that was what was most surprising to me. The revelation in working on the book was Stevie's drug addiction was just, I mean, it was just unreal. And the last thing I would say is Stevie said to me, I thought that I had to prove that I could get higher than anyone else because that would make me cooler than them. And it took me a long time to realize that that just wasn't true. Yeah, so, and then the corollary is, it, it, for me, the most uh, revealing thing was how once Stevie got clean, how, how deeply he embraced it and um, how seriously he took it um, how, to the best of our knowledge, I mean, nothing's ever definitive. I don't think he ever turned back uh, or slipped. And he was he was incredibly devoted, not just to sobriety for sobriety's sake, um, but then to taking the next step, which is becoming uh, a better, fuller person. And something that, that Tommy Shannon said in the book um, that I thought was pretty profound uh, was, you know, people talk a lot about getting clean and nobody really thinks about the next step, which is, you know, a lot of people's addictions stem from problems and depression and uh, avoiding issues. And so um, getting clean is, is really difficult, but in some ways it's the easy part, as hard as it is, because the next step is living without it and dealing with those things that drove you there in the first place. Um, and it's, it's really difficult. Um, and I think we all know people in our own lives who've struggled with that. I certainly know a lot of musicians as well, uh, being that I've you know, been writing about guys like this for 40 or 30 years. Um, it's not a simple transition. And Stevie did it so completely and embraced it so much and, and was sort of evangelical about it, but not in a preachy way. Like, I, I, that's probably not a good word to use because it, it connotes like a, a preachiness that I don't think was there. Um, but a true caring for people and wanting people to experience what he experienced, which is how, how great life can be. Uh, in that, and then the way that he turned it into great art in songs like uh, "Wall of Denial," and, um, "Tightrope," and "Crossroads." Well, he didn't write all the lyrics to all of those, but he he wrote he was involved in them and he embraced them. And I think it's a super super tricky thing to do um, to turn turn uh, thoughts like that into to great art um, that that's not preachy. And those are some of my favorite songs of his. Um, not just because of those messages, but partly because of it. So uh, that full transformation is, is quite remarkable to me. And again, it's, it's interesting when you write a book because it's not like Andy or I, either of us didn't know these things <laughs> beforehand, but um, we didn't fully appreciate the depth of, of the depth <laughs> or, or the height of the height uh, and how, how full the transformation was. And, and uh, uh, several people have commented to me, I hear it a lot, you know, they thank me for how much we emphasize his, his rehabilitation and um, dedication to sobriety in the book, which I'm happy about. And it's, it's one of these things we didn't set out to do that. Uh, I don't think at the start of the book we thought it would be such a focus. But, you know, that's why you, you report just like reporting any news story. You know, you, you don't pre-write the story. And as we did it and talked to people, we, we realized how important it was. And so it became much more part of the book than I think either of us thought it would at the beginning. Yeah, I would add that it's just, it's fascinating and it's like a wonderful uh, thing that's living and breathing and continuing every day that um, this idea 
that, um, you know, either whether you're attributing it to yourself or the people around you, you know, people are, str many people struggle not only with drugs and alcohol, but they might struggle with depression or other things. And Stevie's point was that you should look around, you should be aware of your fellow man and look around and see if you can help people and try to lift them up. You know, it doesn't have to be um, how to stop drinking or doing drugs. It could be helping someone when they're depressed or his other thing was he said that helped you know that it was a big part of him achieving sobriety was accepting the love and the uh, energies and efforts of the people around him that were trying to help him and he wasn't listening because he wasn't in the right frame of mind he was he was closed off he wasn't open to accept and hear what people were saying to him that they loved him and th so you know through accepting love and learning to accept love, then it enabled him to learn to give love. And his, it was such a beautiful eternal message that's going to resonate every day, forever, for new people, always. And so we found in the writing of the book that that was as big a part of the story, at least, and maybe even more so, because it, tra it transcends just music and goes into what it is to be alive um, and a part of society, you know, large or small, and and how you can um, uh, play a positive role, you know, in in the world. Uh, it really is a testament to him as a musician and a person that he made that transition, and that you know his work ethic and his talent, you know, he was able to create great new music afterward and helped a lot of people. Thank you. Um, I have a question uh, for my own curiosity and I encourage uh, folks in the chat to uh, ask questions there and I'll pick them up and, and ask them to Andy and Alan. Um, how do you think history has looked back upon Stevie for the past 30 years? Do you think he gets enough credit? Do you think he uh, there's not enough attention paid to him? Uh, do you uh, has he influenced a lot of musicians? Is he acknowledged? Um, I'll take first crack at that. But, you know, ultimately, no, he hasn't been appreciated enough. Um, and, and I think that, you know, we have to say that because our admiration for him is, is so much um, that there, there's almost no way he could be. Um, I think that he was just turning the corner uh, commercially as well as in his personal life to, to like much bigger things. So if he had lived, I mean, he should still be alive, of course, but if he had even lived five more years, I mean, been able to put out one or two more albums, 10 more years, whatever, you know, as much as you extend that out, he would have put out so much more great music that his legacy would be more and more cemented. Um, you know, Sony, so sometimes like with Jimi Hendrix, they've, you know, people complain that they've exploited his catalog and put out too much. Um, there's almost the, uh, I, you know, I think for like a Hendrix fanatic, there's no such thing as too much. And uh, with Stevie, um, yeah, there's not enough, you know, there's too little. So um, uh, we've realized, you know, I think we had confidence that there was a market for this book. This is part of that same question, but it's like, there, there is a feeling about, there's, it's not like Andy and I are like the only two people out there who, who you know, I loved Stevie and didn't think he quite got his due. There's thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, I don't know, people out there. And, and a lot of them have reached out to us and um, are happy that, you know, so so it's one thing that we feel good about, I think, is that we've been able to, to shine that light back on him. Uh, I, I, Absolutely. I, and I mean, question, Martin. Go ahead. Your, your question, Martin, has everything to do with, with why we wrote the book was we both felt that there was no book that um, uh, honored Stevie's memory as a musician and as a person, um, uh, you know, that rose to the level that he deserved. Um, that was definitely the driving force of writing the book was, uh, was that he was underappreciated and not understood. And there are different reasons for that. Um, in his way, 
Stevie was a bit of an enigma, uh, an enigmatic personality because he had the black hat and he would play with his head down and, you know, uh, it was pretty much all business when he would play a show. He would play, there wasn't a lot of talking. Um, and he didn't really get the opportunity to to uh, talk a lot. Um, in the case of somebody like Jimi Hendrix, I mean, there are hundreds of books about Jimi Hendrix and new ones coming out all the time. In the case of Stevie, there was really only one biography that was written about him um, that was a serious biography that, uh, uh, you know, it had a lot of positive uh, qualities to it, a book, a book called Caught in the Crossfire. Um, but it was written in 92, right after Stevie passed, and uh, virtually none of the principals participated in the writing of the book. Um, his uncle, uh, Uncle Joe Cook, did. But um, Chris, Leighton, Tommy Shannon, Reese Wine, and Shumi Vaughn, none of those people participated. And so, uh, and then there's also the benefit. It wasn't like we purposely waited close to 30 years after Stevie's passing to write this book. But because that is when we wrote the book, we did have the benefit of hindsight uh, in assessing Stevie's importance uh, as a musician, his place in history as a guitar player. And um, so, what one, so one thing that is very clear is... So he passed 30 years ago. Over the last 20 years, uh, you see the power of his influence over other guitar players tremendously. He's certainly one of the most influential guitar players uh, of the last 30 years, um, and his influence only seems to be growing. And you know, and I would add to that because the you know, I could say a lot about this, but the one thing I would add is Stevie had an incredible sound on the guitar that was very distinctive and very powerful. And so the gear that he used, these old beat up Stratocasters with big giant strings playing through all these very specific vintage amplifiers, sometime uh, very shortly after Stevie passed, um, Fender, the guitar company, started issuing these beat up looking guitars. They were brand new, but they were meant and then called custom shop relic guitars meant to look like old beat up guitars like the one Stevie used. And they were trying to capture that sound. And then they reissued all the old amps. And none of that, in my opinion, would have happened without Steve Ray Vaughan. And so right now, today in 2020, you go, uh, uh, you know, on um, sweetwater.com or, you know, um, Sam Ash or, or Guitar Center, and most of what you're going to see are custom shop strats that look like guitars Stevie played, mm -hmm. and Fender amplifiers that are like the ones Stevie used. He had a, a, a uh, almost immeasurable impact on the sound of electric guitar today, and what people think of as a good sound. Um, the one pedal that was his you know a pedal is something guitars plug into guitarists plug into that will change the tone and he used a pedal a distortion pedal that made the guitar uh, sound a little louder and sustain more uh an ibanez tube screamer and so those original ones like the ones that he used on his first record they sell for thousands of dollars now a pedal that was a 40 dollar pedal you know could be $2,500 today just because that's what Stevie used. So um, we're still <laughs> seeing the impact of that yeah. in um, guitars and amps and gear and the, you know, what in the broadest sense, what people even think of as a, what's a good guitar sound, you know, mm -hmm. um, Stevie Ray Vaughan, that's what a good guitar sound is. Yeah. yeah. And I would say just to add to that, that, um, to the first part of the question, what what really turned my head around and thinking about Stevie a little differently was back in 1995 when uh, Jimmy did a tribute to Stevie at Austin City Limits, and I went there for Guitar World, um, and it was sort of where I got to know Jimmy really better and started this process for me to get inside this Stevie Ray world, and um, 
I interviewed B.B. King there, you know, and it was amazing, of course, talking to B.B. King about Stevie. But um, he said, one of the things he said is, you know, Stevie would solo endlessly. The ideas never stopped coming. He didn't repeat himself. He didn't pause to think, which most people do, including me. That's what B.B. said, not me. Uh, and he's, he compared him to Charlie Parker and Charlie Christian. Um, the great guitar, you know, Charlie Christian is sort of considered the guy who invented single note lead guitar playing. Um, and, and Charlie Parker was the great beat golf saxophonist that he mentioned before. So for someone like B.B. King to put Stevie Ray Vaughan in the category of Charlie Parker and Charlie Christian um, changed my, you know, turned my head around a little bit, honestly. And then at the same time, I interviewed Bonnie Raitt and she described Stevie as one of the deepest and darkest and most profound of the bluesmen. And, um, you know, Bonnie's someone who had played with and seen, you know, many, many, many people from Sunhouse, you know, so. Um, and she's no piker herself. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Well, and of course, B.B., right. Just from those people talking about him like that. Um, and it's no B.S. It's not like people. And and you mentioned in the intro at the beginning, some of the people we talked to for the book, but it's by virtue of, you know, but with. You talk to Joe Perry, Greg Allman, uh, Warren Haynes, uh, Joe Perry, you know, and on down the list. The, 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 the respect uh, that, that fellow musicians hold Stevie at is, is pretty awe-inspiring. Uh, out of all the people that you did talk to uh, for the book, uh, were there any conversations that were especially revelatory or surprising or informative that you can remember? Well, I... I mean, we interviewed something like 104, 100, 106 different people, and then those people were interviewed multiple times. So to say that we did something like four to 500 new interviews would not be inaccurate. It was insane. So I would say there was a revelatory stuff from almost everyone. Um, but, you know, uh, it must be said that the book never would have been the same without the input from Jimmy Vaughn, Stevie's older brother, because nobody uh, possessed the kind of, um, uh, you know, um, angle on uh, Stevie's life better than his older brother, Jimmy. Um, and uh, Jimmy could describe, and did to us, so we could describe it to the reader, the way they grew up, what music was like in Dallas growing up around such incredible music that members of Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys would come to their house and play cards and dominoes and they would talk about music and play guitar and they would have these um, music contests every Sunday at um, uh, the drag strip, uh, uh, Yellow Belly drag strip in, in Grand Prairie right near Dallas and so they were just immersed in music and there are two uncles on their mother's side, Martha Cook's side, um, Joe and Gerald, play guitar. Um, and so, you know, Jimmy Vaughn says, uh, you know, if you grow up in Texas, you know, I mean, you don't even have to turn your head. You're, there's amazing guitar players everywhere. Um, so there were musical revelations like that from Jimmy and from the other family members, like uh, one of the cousins, Linda, talking about, they went over the house and Stevie said, oh, you gotta listen to this and put on Light My Fire by the doors because it was the newest record. And she remembers it, the excitement of the moment, you know, that her cousins were plugged into music. Um, so, you, you know, we feel very lucky. We also uh, got um, Ann Wiley, uh, Stevie and Jimmy's aunt and their, their, mo mother's, their mother's sister. Yeah, 93 years old. Wow. Um, she participated as well. That was thanks to uh, her son, Gary Wiley. Um, uh, he said, she won't talk on the phone, but if you send us a bunch of questions, you know, I'll get her to talk about it. So to have Stevie's aunt and uh, his mom's sister talk to us about how they grew up and their household and what they were like as kids. And then even a little later when they were experiencing the beginnings of fame and the whole family would go and Stevie and Jimmy would send a limo and make sure they all had tickets. And uh, so uh, 
all these different people. And then, you know, like people that no one would ever know, like, you know, like somebody like Mike Steele or James Elwell, these people that were Stevie's close friends, like people that just were his friends who could tell you, well, Stevie was broke. He couldn't even afford, you know, a cup of coffee and he had nowhere to live. But this is what he was like as a person at that time. Um, so it's I, I, all it all unfolded in a in a beautiful way, you know. Uh, I want I want to mention one one interview because it was also really a, out of left field for me, which was uh, Ray Wiley Hubbard, um, mm. you know, who's a great Texas singer songwriter, mm -hmm. sort of acoustic bluesman. Yeah, uh, as someone whose music I've liked for a long time, but I never associated with Stevie. Um, but you know, part of what you do talking to people is you ask who else or anyone else you should talk to, I should talk to. And somebody mentioned Ray. So I got in touch with him and I interviewed Ray uh, on the phone. Um, and the reason for interviewing Ray was that he um, felt really profoundly that Stevie saved his life, basically. And, and just to tell you the story really briefly, and this is part of what goes back to what I talked about earlier. Um, you know, Ray was basically, you know, drinking and drugging himself to death. Uh, and finally, somebody got him to go to a meeting and he, he walked in and Stevie was there. Um, and I, I said, was it set up for you to see Stevie there? And he said, you know, I was so messed up. I have no idea. But, um, you know, Stevie was there and, and he and, and in his words, Stevie was the first person he'd ever met who gone sober. It didn't seem like he had joined the 700 Club. Um, he was still hit and cool and the same guy you know and so uh ray just said to him well what's it like to be sober um and he said it's like i could play guitar for the first time and uh ray had known him for years and he said stevie you were the best guitar player i ever heard the first time i ever heard you you know when you were like 19 so you're lying yes. and <laughs> stevie said no uh, my whole life it's like i had boxing gloves on my hand and that's the first time I ever took them, took them off and touched my guitar was when I got clean. And so Ray said, you know, everybody had been trying to talk me into getting clean. And nobody ever said a single thing that made me want to even try it except that, because it spoke to him as a musician <laughs> and, and an artist that, wow, you know, people are scared that it will ruin their art. And Stevie just in this very succinct way um, made a pitch for why it could improve his art and bring him closer to his music and his guitar and his soul, which is in music. Um, and, and, and there's more to the story, but it, it ended with the only time I've ever done an interview in years of doing this where um, I was crying <laughs> and the subject was crying. We were, we were both. And at the end, he said, well, we're friends now. Next time I'm in your area, call me up. <laughs> so, uh, but it was it was very very intense and and it was so uh, incredibly um, emotional and genuine and that that was part of the process that I had mentioned earlier of realizing how important that sobriety was. And Bonnie Bonnie Raitt said a similar thing to you, Alan. Uh, if you right. Wanted, you know. Uh... Right. Well, she said that you know Bonnie was actually the first person to play with Stevie when he was sober because he went to his rehab in Atlanta. And at the very end of it, she was playing in Atlanta and he went out, they were, you know, they were friends. He went out to see her and play with her, sat in. Um, and he, he was terrified. I mean, um, he just, you know, and, and, and she was like, okay, let's see what you got. And by his own account later, he was a little shaky for, for a while, but um, it didn't seem that way to Bonnie. You know, she saw him and he was better than ever by her words. And she said, well, there goes my last excuse. Right, exactly. Um, so great you know yeah because bonnie kept putting off well i can't quit drinking because i won't be able to play anymore and and you know she as soon as she saw him she said oh you know <laughs> that's that's out the window and, and they had that dr john that said he was hitting or was it bonnie said he was hitting even more emotions even deeper right. yeah it, it, it all makes sense uh you know there, there's a lot of um people i see asking to talk about the David Bowie, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. So I'll, 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 we'll we'll go into it, but let me sum up by saying that we could we could talk about that for like an hour and a half. It's really it's a wild story, and That's it is covered. Hmm? Yeah, no, of course, happy to talk about it. But it's but like whatever we tell you now, it's only going to scratch the surface <laughs> in the book. <laughs> no, but, um, so because so by the book, right? Maybe they should buy the yeah, book. Yeah, you got to buy the book because it, it is fascinating and and. 
to sum up, and, and then Andy could get more detail, but the relationship ended up badly, but, uh, and, and some people we've come across have sort of ragged on Bowie because of, you know, not taking care of Stevie in a way they thought they should have in the end. But I would say that uh, Bowie was just an absolute genius, that he saw this guy in Montreux who he had never heard of and immediately recognized his brilliance. Um, and not only that, but how it would fit into what he was doing. Yeah, how to plug and, it into this thing yeah. that and, we and, never expected. It. Yeah, and and nobody. I mean, and and Nile Rogers, uh, who 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 uh, produced Let's Dance, um, and put together the band. Um, so I had always sort of thought that Nile Rogers would have brought Stevie in. Um, it's, you know, Nile is a great guitar player. Nile has. Not necessarily a deep blues background, but definitely a deep R and B blues ish background. And it would make sense if Niall had been the guy who discovered. But he didn't. Niall put the whole rest of that band together, um, for Bowie, but the, the the tracks were basically done. It was Bowie himself who saw um Stevie at Montreux and just was like Psh. and they met and they had this great talk and, and expected, you know, Bowie said, Would you like to play on my album? And I and of course, you know, yes, yes, yes. But nobody thought really it was going to happen i don't think um and then uh, you you want to get more detailed andy about what came next oh sure well um you know in the book it's a it's a really fun story and you know it's like a it's personally uh meaningful and sort of fun for me because i remember the first time chris layton the drummer told me the story about you know they had gone they, you know like the two things you know, you the, you work your butt off your whole life up to that point. Stevie was almost 30. He hadn't made it. He didn't have any money. Things were rough. And um, this crazy thing happened where Jerry Wexler from Atlantic Records, who's one of the most important record producers ever, for just look at Atlantic Records in the 60s with Otis Redding and Aretha Franklin and then Dwayne Allman and, you know, uh, Jerry Wexler, forget about it. Um, him, he and Glenn Fry from the Eagles had co-produced an album by um, Lou Ann Barton, who is a singer in Stevie's the band. They had a band together called Triple Threat and then um, Double Trouble. And so Jerry Wexler and, and Glenn Fry produced this album, a Lou Ann Barton record called Old Enough. And they were going to have the record release party on like March 8th of 1982. It's something like that. We have the calendar from the continent in the book so you could see but jerry happened to be in austin the day before and the day before steve ravon and double trouble were playing the continental club a tiny club maybe holds 100 people and he was blown away completely freaked out Ooh. and he uh said to uh chesley i believe stevie's manager chesley milligan I'm calling Claude Nobbs, the organizer and the head of the Montreux uh, Jazz Festival, um, and telling he, uh, him that he's got to put Steve Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble on the bill. The only unsigned act ever to play in Montreux, Switzerland, and the Montreux Jazz Festival. Wow. So the band was a little like, well, we're going to go to Switzerland and play one gig, like, you know, and we're not, you know, getting paid really. Like, it seems crazy. But what happens? They play the gig. David Bowie sees them, flips out, and says, I want you to be on my next record. And then the manager was very smart, and he booked Steve Ray Vaughan and Double Trouble to play in the lounge. So they were playing in the lounge the next night when Jackson Brown was the headliner. Hmm. And then after Jackson played his set for the festival, the band, specifically the bass player Bob Glob, but um, eventually the entire band went into the bar. They were blown away by Stevie. They had a big jam session. There's, we have great pictures of uh, Jackson Brown playing Stevie's main guitar with Stevie's hat on. I'm wearing his hat. <laughs> and he had mugging it up. And, and so over those two nights, David Bowie says, I want you on my next record. And Jackson Brown says, if you're in L.A., I'll give you free studio time and you can record uh, there. So... No, uh, Thanksgiving of 82, so a few months later, um, they're in L.A. just for two and a half days to record. And at 2 o'clock in the morning, one of those nights, 
the phone rings in the hotel they're staying at. Chris Layton, the drummer, answers the phone, and this English accented voice says, Hello, is Steve Ray Vaughan there? And, you know, he said, Who is this? It's three o'clock in the morning. David Bowie. And um, Chris Layton in his colorful way goes, Ziggy Stardust, like the thin white dude, that, that David Bowie. And, um, and so this confluence of things, you know, happened. And so to cut to the chase, Stevie did brilliant work on the record. And for many of us, for me and for Eric Clapton, this is the only time I'm ever going to put myself and Eric Clapton in the same sentence together. You know, that's how we discovered Steve Ray Vaughan. A lot of people discovered Stevie because they heard this solo on Let's Dance or China Girl and said, who's playing guitar? This guitar playing is incredible. And, um, but he, the tapes he recorded um, at Jackson Brown studio, uh, they got a record deal from those tapes. They thought it was a demo. It became the first album, Texas Flood. And so right when Stevie was gonna leave to go on tour with Bowie for a year, Epic was releasing his album and Stevie didn't really know what to do and he was being pulled in two directions. And so to set the record straight, because it's like, did he quit? Was he fired? Did they, was there bad blood? What happened? The simplest uh, explanation that we can, uh, that we were able to determine was uh, Stevie wasn't happy with typical sideman wages, was seeing what he could do about trying to get paid what he thought would be fair for what he was doing, but at the same time was very torn and was thinking, you know what? Because there were people telling him, maybe, you know, even Carlos Alomar, who was the band leader for Bowie, said, you know what, man, your record's coming out. Like, you go, you could go on tour with Bowie for a year, and maybe it'll help your career, but maybe it won't. This is all about Bowie. Yeah, maybe, right. And so, you know, by the so his situation had really changed from the time he agreed to do the tour until they were getting ready to do it because yes. he didn't have a record deal. It was all, you know, from he had January, some from January to and April I, or March. I think well, one interesting lesson about the mantra thing I've thought about is so, so we, you know, Andy, Andy, I think Andy told it perfectly, just left out one little thing, which is that the mantra show itself wasn't a big success. Um, they That's didn't true. feel good about it. It was, um, it was, um, like mostly an acoustic night and they came out and did their thing. And it was like, you know, they felt like they were, you know, unwelcome guests at a party, um, but they didn't alter what they did. And I think that's like an important thing. And that's, and, 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 you know, Stevie just did his thing. I mean, he could have altered it, you know, he could have toned it down and, and played a softer show and, and been brilliant in his own way, but that, you know, he was himself, he knew who he was um, and he, he did his thing and that's what Bowie heard. And I, I think there's a, a little bit of a lesson there can I, somebody can I, can I i'm sorry can i just answer quickly this question from isaac he said so let's dance delayed the release of texas flood um you know it might have only in a production sense in in that stevie when he thought he was doing the tour was rehearsing and he there was work that needed to be done on texas flood like finalizing the the um the lead vocals so you know just in a production sense Yes, maybe it did uh, delay the release of it. I don't think uh, other than that, uh, it did. Um, and it was just this sort of crazy confluence uh, of events. Um, and, you know, as we talk about in the book, when they thought that Stevie would be on the tour and it was discussed that Double Trouble would open some of the Bowie shows, um, they were trying to book Double Trouble um, on the off nights or, you know, make it work so that while Stevie's in this city or this city, this city with Bowie, uh, he could squeeze in a date with Double Trouble. And then ultimately when he quit, because I think it is most accurate to say that he quit, um, he ended up playing a lot of dates the same night in the same city as Bowie. And we have pictures in the book of these flyers that they would put on the cars of all the people that went to the Bowie show. And it would say, after David Bowie, go to this club and see the guitar player on Let's Dance, Steve Ray Vaughan. Because that was the sort of uh, overlap of when they were trying to do the two things. And the one thing I'll 
end with, and Alan will let me know what I forgot to say, is that when Stevie did uh, leave Bowie, um, you know, there was this big, it's still, you know, people are asking, like, what happened? Um, uh, uh, Charles uh, Chesley, the manager, had hired uh, Charles Comer, one of the most infamous, well-known uh, rock and roll publicist who would work with the Beatles and the Who and the Stones from the beginning. I got to meet Charles. He was an incredible guy. He was he was kind of like, like W. C. Fields, this older Irish guy with a big mm. you know, drinking nose. And he'd say, "Steely Devon, ah, oh, the movie stars love Steely Devon." Uh, he'd say, "Get your you got to take your picture with Steely Devon." That's the only reason there's a picture of me and Stevie because Charles Charles insisted. But um, uh, what the hell was I just going to say, Alan? <laughs> um, but as Stevie would say in the interviews, once he left, he would say to the interviewers, first thing, I'm not going to say anything negative about Bowie. Like, don't, you know, don't ask me to say, you know, I'm not going to sit here and knock that guy. I'm not doing it. Uh, it's whatever you want, but I'm not going to knock yeah. it. That was after all of this headbutting and fighting and, you know, and his internal turmoil about whether he was doing the right thing or not. But he still, you know, uh, was like, you know, thankful to Bowie for what right. it did for him. It was really phenomenal. Yeah. And, you know, th th this is a, basically in the book, but not quite in this context. So when I interviewed Niall Rogers and I asked him, was Steve, did Stevie seem intimidated? Um, because, you know, he hadn't at that point really recorded, um, you know, other than little demos and whatnot. And he, he, was in New York at the Power Station, which was the premier studio in New York with David Bowie and Niall Rogers, who, you know, and um, and Niall like laughed. He said, no, he wasn't intimidated. <laughs> in fact, he was like, he was completely comfortable in himself. He listened to everything once and then played a solo and almost everything on the album is first or second takes. Cool. In fact, he not only was not intimidated, but after the first day he, he called up and had, um, his, the people from his office send up um, Sam's barbecue and gave it to Bowie and <laughs> he fed everyone lunch on the second day. Wow! Because he was he was disgusted by the bar. Uh, they had barbecue for lunch on the first day that Niall got from somewhere in New York, and he was like, "This ain't barbecue." Yeah, <laughs> so. we still suffer from that. Thanks. Uh, the, uh, it's a great part of the book. It was, it's interesting to hear it coming from you. Uh, there are a bunch of questions in the Ask the Question feature. I'm going to combine two right now. Uh, did Chris and Tommy find relating their stories cathartic after almost 30 years? And asking, uh, with that, uh, uh, there's another question. I realized that Stevie was more profoundly influenced by Jimmy than any other player, including Hendrix. Do you think Jim, Jimmy gets his due as the giant that he is? Let me take the Jimmy and you take the... You're supposed to say who's supposed to answer, Martin. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, they believe you're Chris Wallace, and this is the yeah. uh, you know presidential debate. Alan, uh, first, please. <laughs> um, I, I'm just going to take the Jimmy part. I don't really think Jimmy gets his due um, because he's, he's, he's a subtle player, you know, and he's, you know, he favors the style of music he favors is... is, is you know, more tuned for, for, for real lovers of blues and jazz, I guess. Um, but I think he gets his due from other guitar players. I mean, I can't tell you how many people are just rattling people off the top of my head because these are people I talk to, but, you know, uh, Derek Truck and Warren Haynes, Susan Tedeschi, Ronnie Earl, they love uh, Jimmy and they come, you know, so I think musicians talk about him a lot. Um, and I and I think that 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 it, it is true that Stevie was most profoundly influenced by Jimmy. And I mean, uh, I'm sure he was as the years went on as well. But at the beginning, it, it's just obvious, of course, because he was his brother. And um, you know, I think anyone who hasn't read the book might not know this, but Jimmy was a huge deal when he was a kid. By the time he was 14, 15, he was making more money than their dad, um, playing in a really really popular band and out touring and he was he was an absolute legend first in their neighborhood of oak cliff and then in the whole city of dallas so it's not just that stevie heard him playing in the bedroom or something which probably would have been influential enough but he heard that and then he saw him doing this 
um, and, and, and really making something of it. So he knew it was possible not only to become a great guitarist from your little bedroom in Oak Cliff, but to become a successful guitarist. You know, I'm sure um, that, that those both had a huge influence. But Andy, you, you, Andy spent a lot more time over us. I've, I've spent plenty of time with Chris and Tommy and talking to them, um, probably more than, than, you know, most any journalist except Andy, who spent way more than me. So I think he's better uh, positioned to, to talk about the, the Chris and Tommy part. Uh, yeah. Uh, the one thing that I would add about Jimmy is that it, what's in the book is, is that there was a real uh, point of departure where Jimmy said, you know what, I'm not into this rock and roll stuff. And, uh, and he, for personally, he said it was when he saw Muddy Waters at the Family Dog. And he just felt like the blues, real blues, was meant more to him than any other music. And he said, you know what, the music business, all that stuff, and dressing up. And, you know, he said, I don't care about any of it. And I just want to play blues. And he said, I know it was selfish. And guys like Mark Benno and other people said they thought Jimmy could have been, a, you know, uh, he's still really, Jimmy's still really good friends with uh, Steve Miller. You know, one of the most successful uh, rock musicians who sold more records than anybody. But there were people that said when Jimmy stopped playing rock, and that, and the other thing is that Stevie, Jimmy's style of playing in those days was closer to the style that people uh, correspond to Stevie very fast. That Jimmy played that way in the early days. That he played real fast, and it was much closer to a sound and style that we associate with Stevie. There are recordings that exist where you can hear Jimmy playing like that. A lot of people wouldn't believe it because his style changed so much and became so much simpler and really more based on what Jimmy likes to call the BB way, like a very specific Chicago electric BB King style of playing. But um, so, you know, Jimmy took a different course and Jimmy was aware that he wasn't going to necessarily be on as big a, world stage because of that because he was outside the realm of the most popular music of all and the other thing to answer the question about whether chris and tommy found it cathartic you know uh i met them uh right when stevie died and so the first interview i did interviews i did with chris and tommy were in 1992 it was very far stevie had just died so you know, I had to be very careful about the, the questions that I asked. Um, I don't think it was cathartic necessarily at that point because it was still pretty shocking. But, um, you know, then Chris and Tommy went and formed Dark Angels. So I interviewed them when they did that, and I got to know them a little better. And then by 95, 96, five, six years after Stevie died, they did Storyville. And I started to spend more time with them. And then I was sending them recordings of, of my guitar playing and they liked it. And by the end of the nineties, they asked me to play on their instructional videos, play some shows with them, um, record with them in the studio. And so by the time we get to 2000, 10 years after Stevie died, I had been going to Austin and staying at Tommy's house when I went and staying there for three, four days at a time. And, so uh, this, you know, personal relationship with Tommy Shannon and Chris Layton really got much, much closer. And um, something that really plays a big part in, in the book itself, like what the book is, is it's very funny because it was 2000 was the 10 year anniversary of Stevie's passing. So it was very normal for guitar magazines to say we're going to commemorate this. So I was asked to write something, as was Alan. Um, he, you know, we weren't writing together, but he was writing a 10-year anniversary a piece. Was it for a Revolver? Yeah, well, it actually began as something that was supposed to be for the Stevie Ray Vaughan box set, which Andy and I both also contributed to. But the box set got so delayed that uh, it ended up being okay. <laughs> transitioning to a 10-year anniversary. But, but yeah, it's true. We were both doing it at the same time. So... When I went down to Austin to interview Chris and Tommy and Reese for this cover story of Guitar World, you know, commemorating the 10 year anniversary of Stevie's passing, I recorded something like 14 90 minute tapes 
So, you know, whatever that is, like uh, 19 and a half hours of uh, <laughs> 20, uh, 21 hours, whatever it is, 20 hours of stuff um, with those guys, which was completely crazy. And then I did something that I've never done in my life. I got home, looked at it, and I said, if I don't transcribe it all right now, I never will, even though I'd been asked to write a 4,000 word piece. So I wrote it all down, transcribed all of it. It was 95 thousand words and uh some of those conversations took place at three o'clock in the morning and i asked them some really really personal questions that you certainly wouldn't ask if you didn't know somebody that well but on top of that you probably wouldn't ask if it wasn't three o'clock in the morning and you'd been talking for eight hours and uh and they you know shared some really really beautiful stuff about stevie that uh, we're so thankful it afforded Alan and I the ability to paint a picture of this guy, of who he really was. So when you read the book, you really get a feeling for Steve Ray Vaughan, the person. And to answer the question, I do think ultimately uh, it has been cathartic for them to talk about it as the years have gone on. Because 2000 is a long time ago, 20 years ago. So, I, so we talked much, much more when we started to write the book. I mean, I can't even know how many hours I talked with Chris and Tommy. And um, you could do this is, a, this is a part of the beautiful thing. It makes it a lot of work. But one of the beautiful things about these having this kind of relationship and being given, thank you, St. Martin's, the uh, the free reign to do what we did. I could do a three hour interview with Chris that yielded one sentence mm. that that found its place in the book because it was perfectly poignant and perfectly put. And so it was a lot of work, but it never would have happened without, you know, all, uh, all those tire treads, you know? Uh, yeah. And I think that, I think that it, my sense is that, for Tommy, this whole process was particularly cathartic. I do think it was. And I think really, I don't know, I, really, really satisfying. I think he felt like Stevie as a musician and as a person. And, and of course, Chris and Tommy were both really close with, with Stevie, but Tommy more, I mean, Tommy really, really, really considers him his best friend ever in the world. And I don't think he felt that his best friend ever in the world was ever captured as a person. Um, and, and he feels that we did. And he's been extremely kind to us and basically just letting us know that, um, which, of course, is incredibly satisfying to us because, uh, you know, it's great that the book's been successful and people love it. But that uh, that's, you know, if that wasn't there, none of it would be pretty hollow. So he came to our um, Austin um, reading um, the weekend. It came out and he was sitting in the front row. Um, it, it, it was it was slightly unnerving at first, and then it was incredibly uh, satisfying. It, it meant a lot. Chris was on the road, so he wasn't there. But um, and I'll just tell you one other funny thing with Chris. Like you know, Chris was the guy we would call sometimes. Like he, it was wonderful that he was so available by phone and text, like Andy said. And you know, sometimes we'd go back and forth. Well, when did this happen? When did it happen? I'll call Chris. You know, so there was once where, where we were stuck on something and. Uh, I, Andy said, you call Chris <laughs> about this one. So I, I did. And I said, when was that? And he said, you know, you guys got me doubting my memory so much, man, because we kept correcting him. You know, he would tell us. He got so said, much. No, actually. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you know, I, you got me doubting my memory so much. I don't know. You guys. There you go. Well, then we went to Indianapolis and we're like, no, 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 no. no, you didn't. no, no you didn't. Yeah. So really? so you guys. <laughs> uh, we, uh, Thanks for that. We got about six more minutes and a bunch more questions. Uh, and so I'm going to try to squeeze a few in. And, and Andy, we can start with you. Interested to hear more about Stevie's relationship with Albert King and King's influence on him. Oh, this is so great. So I, I'll make it short because we don't have that much more time. But, um, you know, there's one story in the book about the, the one job Stevie had for what, like a day or something when he was 14 years old. Um, you know, like working at a greasy spoon and he was carrying the trash out and he slipped and he fell on top of these barrels that had hot uh, grease and oil in them from cooking. Thankfully it had a lid on it and he didn't 
fall in and get burned. But when he fell, it cracked the lid and the owner screamed at him, hey, you broke the lid on my barrel. And Stevie was thinking like, I could have gotten killed and this guy's worried about the lid. And so he said he stormed home madder than he'd ever been and put on uh, an Albert King record as loud as it would go. And he said, from now on, I'm just want to, I just want to be like Albert King. And um, when he came back from playing on the Bowie record, um, he ran into, I think it was Mike Steele, but, or no, wasn't it? It was uh, Ray Benson from Asleep at the Wheel. And uh, Ray said, how'd it go? And Stevie said, oh, I just sprayed Albert King all over that fucker. Um, and um, there's a great story in the book about uh, when Stevie in 1979 got to sit in with Albert for the first time um, at Antone's. And Albert was a real gruff personality. I got to know Albert. So did Alan. I know he, we were both very thankful for that opportunity. And um, Jimmy Vaughn said it best. He goes, Albert didn't like anybody, but he liked Stevie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a big and, deal. Uh, Stevie sat in with him. Not, not just because it was a big deal for Stevie, but because nobody sat in with Albert. It's just he wasn't that, you know, he wasn't that guy. Yeah, so they, they had a really beautiful relationship. And um, and Albert even said it to Stevie once when Stevie was still drinking. He said, you know, uh, I've seen you wrestle that bottle uh, two or three times before the show. You know, the gig ain't no time to get high. Hmm. He and, tried. Yeah. He tried. Uh, I'm going to combine two questions, and we can start with Alan. Any insight into the relationship between Stevie and Johnny Winter? Uh, and also, Stevie did a tour with Jeff Beck. What was their relationship like? Pick a pick. Ooh, okay. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Jeff Beck and Lee. John, uh, Andy knew Johnny Winter really well um, and, and has more insight. But but in short, there wasn't an extensive relationship between Johnny and Stevie, which is a little bit surprising. Um, but Andy can answer that more. Um, and there also wasn't a super tight relationship with, with uh, Stevie and Jeff Beck. Um, in in uh, I think what year was it ninety five when they when they both played at the um, epic uh, Sony convention in Hawaii. It was eighty four. It was very early. Eighty four. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I of course it wasn't ninety five. That was five years after Stevie died. It meant eighty five. Um, but any, yeah, so Jeff sat in with them, and apparently they didn't interact much. Um, I haven't heard a lot about them it, it didn't um, help it didn't help that stevie blew jeff off the stage completely even though he was intimidated and you can see that he's freaked out there's video of it but stevie's yeah, playing is unbelievable it. and jeff just looks like oh my god like you know i got thrown in with the lions yeah so but but andy we didn't nobody really talked to us a lot about those guys developing a close relationship during the it, tour they, well they didn't you know, yeah. uh, you know, uh, somebody tried to do an interview for, for Rolling Stone thinking because there was a cover of Stevie and Jeff um, together for Rolling Stone and the writer, whoever it was, thought he was going to get the two of them. And Jeff just wouldn't have any part of it. And the guy ended up with barely any story. He just hung out with Stevie and Jeff just wouldn't even take part. And then every night, he they on, the show. To be honest, he's one of the very few people, honestly, who, who turned us down. <laughs> so. hmm. um, the, every night at the end, they would trade who was the headliner night after night, you know, who played first, who played second. But they would always end with the jam on going down. But the last night of the tour, Chris said that um, they closed. So Jeff opened and then they were going to go back out uh or it was time for the jam and jeff and the band had just left and not said anything and you know there was no jam and chris thought that was maybe a little bit rude you know that it was like you know we're out of here johnny winter um uh, i try to really put it in a nutshell quick um you know johnny uh is a texas guy he's a texas guitar player um and tommy shannon uh, played with Johnny Winter and is, is on the first few Johnny Winter albums. And, and played at Woodstock with him. Yes. And so, you know, I asked Stevie, uh, you know, when, when Stevie would talk about his influences, I mean, 
virtually every guitar player he would mention was a black guitar player. And he would say, well, I would listen to the radio and, uh, you know, there were these shows produced by uh, Ernie's Record Mart. And he'd say, there weren't too many of us white guys on there. And I said, well, what about Johnny Winter? And, you know, was he an influence? And Stevie said, yeah, but it was really much later. Um, you know, it just wasn't part of him growing up. And, and he, he, he said, when I got to know Tommy, you know, that's when Johnny became a little more of an influence. But, you know, it seems, I could tell you just from knowing Johnny, Johnny was a great guy, but um, he's an intense person and he had a similar relationship with uh, Dickie Betts. You know, he could be very competitive. And compliments didn't necessarily roll off of, of Johnny that uh, quickly. And so, you know, um, they didn't get close for sure. And so there really isn't much to say. I don't think, I don't think they had a relationship. You know, Tommy loved Stevie. Tommy loved Johnny. I mean, they were as close as you could be. But Johnny and Stevie, you know, it, it didn't happen. When, uh, we're a little over. I'm going to ask one more question, and then, and then we'll stop. Uh, did the Stones almost stop sign Stevie? We could we could both say yes at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean... The, the, the way we understand it and, and report it, so, so the Rolling Stones were starting a record label um, and, and, and Stevie and the band flew up from, from Austin to New York to play at the Dance Aterio, which is kind of a happening, almost like a disco, really like a dance club um, for, for the Stones and Mick and, and Ronnie Wood were there um, and loved it. And it was a great success and they thought they were going to be signed and then it didn't happen. Um, the, the, the way it basically came down is that Mick had, Mick went to the whoever they'd hired to run the record company and say, this guy's great, sign him. And the guy said, we're not sending a blues act. <laughs> so, I, thought Mick um, was, I thought Mick was the one that said blues doesn't sell. So, well, I think, yeah, I thought it was Mick repeating what the record business, maybe it was Mick directly. So they, they definitely loved him. And, but you know, they, they put out the Peter Tosh record. <laughs> Some people <laughs> might remember. Well, what's, in, yeah. what's in the book is, is so they set up, there was a connection. Sam Cutler was, had been Rolling Stones tour manager. He ran the stables that Stevie's manager, uh, Francis Carr, was half of his management company. She owned Manor, Manor Downs uh, Racetrack. And so there was a Rolling Stones connection there in the first place. And um, so they, in trying to get signed, flew up to New York and played what they called a drive by, uh, like audition for the Stones at Danceteria, this this uh, dance club uh, in New York City in 1982, the height of, you know, new wave and, uh, uh, you know, punk new wave and disco. And um, uh, it, it was just a handful of people there and uh, Ronnie Wood and uh, no Keith, but Johnny Winter was there actually. And, um, but what happened just from that, and this is where Charlie Comer was so smart, Charlie got a picture of Stevie and, and Mick in the dressing room hanging out on the couch. And in the random notes in, in Rolling Stone magazine, they ran that picture and said, you know, Texas guitar player Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, hanging out with um, uh, Mick Jagger, the Rolling Stones. And, you know, it says something, I'm thinking of signing him or something like that. It was this tiny little thing. But the fact that it was in Rolling Stone gave Stevie this, um, you know, uh, you know, put him on a platform. Yeah. He never would have been. That one thing happened because of Charlie Comer. So and, and also, I know it's people, like it was worth all that work to do, but it was. Yeah, and that, that was also right before, you know, it was leading up to the when they played the show that Jerry Wexler saw that led to Montreux, that led to everything else. And, and Jerry Wexler may or may not have seen that in Rolling Stone and been looking for them down there so i think you know it was part of the process of where they were nowhere and all of a sudden they started to be somewhere alan and andy i love talking with you uh and this was really great thanks everybody for joining us if you're interested in buying the book it's available in hardcover ebook and paperback there's a link in the chat that you can follow uh if you're wanting more uh and you're not following the texas flood facebook page it's a really great daily dose of 
of Stevie. They do a really good job. Oh, audio, thanks. You know, I always <laughs> get audio. That's right. Uh, yeah, the audio uh, is excellent too. It has some special features on it. You could subscribe to St. Martin's Press for more events. And this event will be available uh, as a link for viewing again, and we'll post it on the Texas Flood Facebook page. Really can't thank, thank you. you. Really enjoyed that. Thank you so much. Thanks thank so much. Thank you, Martin. And just thanks everyone for tuning in and for uh, all the support you guys have given us for the last year since the book came out. And um, I know there's a few questions we didn't get to. So if you send them over to the Texas Flood, uh, Facebook page, we'll answer them and post them up there as well. That's right. Thanks so much. And thanks to everybody at St. Martin's. You guys are always incredible. We appreciate it a lot. We love you guys. <laughs> thanks. All right. Bye. Bye, everyone.